is also a very special night. And the incredible siata de shmaya that we should have on the learning of tonight and the growth in the zechut of the Torah of our learning, Hashem should send them refuah shleima, bitoch kol chole amo Yisrael, amen ken yiratzon. As well, lilu nishmat. One more time. Miriam bat farcha. Ruach Hashem tenichena began eden, amen. Okay, guys, here we go. We have a big share tonight because it's a big place. Tonight, they are not out of a beautiful turnout, but tonight's a big night. And we should be zochev with siyata deshmaya to really get the incredible direction from Bore Olam and the right words to be able to give over tonight the feelings and the words that will reach home. Kedarkeinu Bakodesh, I'd like to start with a beracha. Baruch Ata Adonai. Eloheinu, Melech, Haolam, Shahakol, Nihia, Bidvaro. Alakadosh. <clears throat> Gentlemen, tonight is the night. Tonight the Khatam Sofer teaches us in the incredible Lel Asara B'Tevet. Tonight is the night that Hashem and Pamal Yishal Ma'ala. Hashem decides tonight if Mashiach is going to come this year to Klal Yisrael. So when I told you tonight was a big night, I wasn't joking. Tonight is the night. Tonight is the night that the great decision is being machriz in Shamayim. Maybe even as we sit here to learn. Hashem's going to decide if this year Mashiach is going to come. And after everything we went through in the last six to eight months, and this year that we call 2020, or maybe better yet, the year that the Chatam Sofer talked about hundreds of years ago, it's the year Taf Shin Pe Aleph. Me'ashpot Yarim Evyon. Tavshin Pe Aleph is the word Ashpot. Me'ashpot Yarim Evyon. The year that we're going to be raised up from the depths. Year that we're going to be raised up from the difficulties and the sorrow. He told us hundreds of years ago, keep an eye on the year Tavshin Pe Aleph. Because that year has the potential to be an incredibly great year for the Jewish people. Tonight is the decision of how great that year will be for us this year. It could be a Mashiach year. And tonight the decision goes down. And of those of you who remember this past Tuesday night, we touched upon why exactly tonight is so special. We already mentioned that Asara Betevet marks the beginning of the siege on Jerusalem, what would be the first step on that step-by-step -step process of Chorban. And because the Chorban process started on Asara Betevet, so too the Geula process is destined to start on Asara Betevet. In Judaism, we have this always. The way you come in is the way you go out. So if Asara Betevet was the mark of the beginning of Chorban, then so too Asara B'tevet needs to be the mark of the beginning of the Geula. And that's why tonight is the night that Hashem decides, says Chatam Sofer, if this is going to be the year of Mashiach. Amazing. And we already mentioned Tuesday night a special idea, a takeaway from that class that we gave on Rav Shlomo Kluger's revelation on the unique miracle of Hanukkah. And how the Jewish people were able to bring themselves to live and to serve Hashem. And Hashem says, if you initiate, if you raise yourself up, if you raise up your game, and you be a people, then I in suit will come back and mimic you and mirror you. Hashem Hashem is your shadow. If you're able to step up your game, and live lamala mi derech 
If you're able to come and be a bigger than nature Jew, you're able to be a miraculous Jew, then Hashem says, I'll follow back in suit with miracles as well. If tonight we could be a Jew that demonstrates to Hashem that we want Geula like nobody else, we really want it. We're done. We want to go home. We want this to already end. But if Hashem sees it not just as, as, as just lip service, but if He sees the emotion, and He sees that the Jewish people are ready to fight and to die for the cause of Klali Yisrael, Torah, Eretz Yisrael, that we can finally come home to Abba, we can finally come home to a Bet HaMikdash, when Borei Olam sees that we're real and that we're worked up about it, that we're ready to fight for it, that he's ready to bring it. It was a very famous story that they came to the house of the Bet HaLevi. The Bet HaLevi was the grandfather of what today we call the Briska dynasty. The father of the great Reb Chaim Brisker. The grandfather of the great Briskerov. Rev, Rev Yosef, or Yosef Ber, I think it was. I believe that was his name. The Bet HaLevi. The Bet HaLevi, Rabotai, was once approached by a certain rabbi and a delegation. And they were asking him to become the rabbi in their city. And he didn't want it. And he refused them straight out. And they asked him, and they pleaded with him, please, come as the rabbi of our city. And no matter what they told him, no matter what they told him, he would not come. He did not want the position. Till finally they said to him, after coming to him so many times, they said to him, Rabbi Yoshaber, there are thousands of people waiting for you. They're waiting for you to come to our city and teach Torah. When he heard that, Thousands of people, Eden, Jews, waiting for me to come teach Torah. Immediately, he went, picked up his rekel, put on his robe, put on his jacket, put on his coat. And he walked out and he followed the delegation. And he made his way over to the new town and he became Rav of that new town. The Hafez Chaim used to say, If Rabbi Yoshev Ber Salavechik heard a few thousand people were waiting for him, and that was the clincher on something that he did not want to go to do. But when he heard that there are Jews waiting for him, he had no choice. How can I let them wait for me? How can I keep them on a stand-up? How can I keep them waiting? For a few thousand Jews, he had no choice but to come. He says if Mashiach would know that there's a few thousand Jews waiting for him in Klal Yisrael, he would have no choice to come. How can I keep them waiting? How can I keep them waiting? How can I stand them up? And if Mashiach hasn't come yet, it's because we might not be waiting. We got to show that we really want it. That it's not just lip service. But that every day in Tefillah, we're really wanting, we're really waiting. And for that alone, just for the fact that there are so many Jews waiting for Mashiach to come, even if we're not worthy, but just the waiting factor could bring him. Because how could I keep them waiting? They've been waiting for so long. We've gone through so much. And tonight is a big night nice for us. Tonight is the decision, says Khatam Sofer, to see if we're going to have to wait another year or not. But remember, after the corona, and after the suffering, and after everything we went through, there's a chance that tonight, Hashem might pick that this year could be the final Geula. I want you to picture something in your mind just for a moment. I want you to picture a husband and wife who walks into the front doors of what we would call today an orphanage. And there are hundreds of kids all over the place. Yitomim. 
waiting for a family one day to come to adopt them. And suddenly the word comes out and it immediately runs through the hallways. There's a couple that just came in. They're looking to adopt the boy. At that minute, all the kids go running back to their rooms and they jump into the showers and they take a shower and they put on their best clothing and they brush their teeth and they do their hair and they put on their best shirt and they put on their best shoes and they come in running downstairs and they're all standing with smiles and they're showing uh, their best behavior. And this husband and wife walks into the dining room. And they look around and they see thousands of boys. And they're all familyless, homeless, in an orphanage. And the orphanage master comes walking in and he says, Boys, there's a couple here today. And this couple is going to pick one child to bring home and adopt as their own. We want everybody to stand and line up. And they line up all the boys, rows after rows after rows. And the couple walks down the rows, looking at each boy in the face for only a moment. One after the next. If you were standing in those lines, what would be going through your heart at that moment? Pick me! Please, pick me! I'm going to be the best. You'll see. I'll be the best son you've ever had. I'll be loyal. I'll be helpful. I'll never be chutzpah. I'll be the kid that will bring you nahat. I mean, we would scream anything. But one thing we'd scream out on top of our lungs. Please, pick me. From all the nations in the world. God walked up and down the aisles of nations, of people, and He walked by each and every one of them, and He stopped by us, and He picked us as His kid, as His nation, and He, so to speak, chose us as a chosen people, and He says, I want you. Hashem, you picked us. You brought us out of there. You took us out of this place called Egypt. You picked us. You brought us to Matan Torah. You brought us through the desert and then to Eretz Israel. And tonight, Asher, could you pick us again? Could you pick us again? Abba, pick us again. Take us home. Take us home with you. We're done here. The American dream is no longer. We look around and this is not the place we grew up in. We have a lot of hakarat tov to this land. It was a land of chesed. And we were able to be marbitz Torah and build Torah and do incredible, incredible avodat kodesh. Who would ever believe that in a country outside of Eretz Yisrael, you could have a MetLife stadium with a siyum hashas, not once, but kama v'kama pa'amim, of hundreds of thousands of Jews standing together and dancing over a siyum hashas in a football stadium. You'd never believe that. We have tremendous hakarat tov to the land. But we, all rec we also recognize its day. And we recognize its time. And its time, as we see, is getting closer to being done. And it's a night like tonight that Hashem is going to decide. Is Mashiach going to come this year? Abba, pick us. We want to go home with you. We want it to happen already tonight. We should be zocher, Abotai. That we should hear the great news from Shamayim. They should let us in on the secret of what's going to go down tonight in heaven. If we can finally get after the incredible year that we just went through if we can get a break a final geula amazing so gentlemen here we go there's a problem with the
I got a text that the internet went down, but I can't tell the story. One second, I want to just see quickly. What, from my daughter? Yeah. Yeah. Looks good. Let's do it again. Just try it again. Now this is not going on internet, this is going on the whole thing. On the uh, LTE. Mm. You said it's up now. So, it's good. Back up? Yep. So Rebel Tai, last week, we read this incredible story, one of the greatest stories ever told in history, the stories of Yosef and his brothers. Yosef's brothers come down to Mitzrayim. They're looking for food. And sure enough, where do they find themselves? Standing right in front of the viceroy of Egypt. Little did they know who that exactly was. And here what's amazing is, is that the viceroy of Egypt is speaking to them with strong words. And they're going back and forth in negotiation with him. And they're telling him over their life story. And the more they engage, the more they don't realize that they're standing and looking their own brother dead in the eye. And this was always a pellet to me. I always ask myself, you know, me and my brothers were very close. We might be placed spread out into different cities. I have one brother now in LA, one brother in Lakewood. I'm here in Brooklyn. Yossi's in Cleveland. My last brother that many people don't know about, and that's Ellie. He's now a Rosh Kolel in Montreal. We're all over the place. I guess that's the way Borel wants us. <laughs> he, wants, he wants to spread us out. Right? Shimon Levi, you don't keep them too close together. <laughs> but nonetheless, we're very close. When we get together, even for a day or two, once a year, it's like we were never apart. And time can go on. I'm talking about mamash. We don't, sometimes we don't see each other for almost a year or two. Now, I'm not saying it's the same. Yosef did not see his brothers for over 22 years, which is a tremendous difference. But you're looking your brother in the face. How is it that they don't recognize that this is Yosef looking at them, knowing everything about them, talking to their hearts? How is it that they didn't recognize that this was Yosef? So Rashi tells us, Vehem lo hikiruhu. Yosef recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. Why, says Rashi? Because he had a beard. And because of that, his appearance was somewhat different than the 17-year-old boy they remembered once upon a time selling down to Egypt. And because of that, they just didn't put together that this was Yosef looking at them from the viceroy position of Egypt. But I want to ask you a question. We all know that Yosef HaTzadik was destined to be the fourth of the Avot HaKdoshi. And the Gemara in Sota tells us a very interesting and maybe uh, age-appropriate story. How Yosef, when he ran out of the house at the moment of being tested by Eshet Potiphar, and there were ten drops that came out of his fingers, those were the ten tribes that he was going to have and lost. And instead, it was only left to him two tribes. And that's why he ended up with Ephraim and Menashe. But at that moment, the moment of that incredible test, he saw, do you know shall Yosef? Do you know rather shall Aviv? He saw the image of his father. Chazal tell us that the image of his father was his exact image. Yosef and Yaakov looked identically alike. 
And if that's the case, I mean, we still have a major question here. The brothers come down to Mitzrayim. They're standing in front of the viceroy. They're talking to their brother Yosef, but they don't know it's him. Why don't they recognize him? Because he has a beard. Okay, so they don't recognize him as Yosef, but shouldn't they recognize him as Yaakov? He looks exactly a spitting image like his father. And I would venture to say that Yaakov Avinu had a beard. And if that's the case, you're looking at Yaakov Avinu replica with the beard in full bloom in front of your eyes, sitting on the throne of Egypt. So you don't recognize him as Yosef. It's not the 17-year-old boy that you sold down 20-some-odd years ago. But he looks exactly spitting image of your father. Wouldn't you recognize him? Just for that alone, wouldn't you recognize him? How come they didn't recognize him as Yaakov? Rabotai, just to up the ante of the question a little bit, to make it even stronger. You know, the Midrash tells us that Yosef knew good and well that when his brothers come down to Egypt, the first thing he needs to do. I mean, like they say, the best offense, the best defense is a good offense. He jumped and he split Shimon and Levi. Because he knew right away that if these two guys get angry and they're together, they can wipe out the entire Egypt. They already wiped out a different city. They already wiped out Shechem. So therefore, said Yosef, I have to take a certain precautionary measure. And right away, what does he do? From amongst all the brothers, he arrests Shimon and puts him in jail. Do you think it's so easy to arrest Shimon? Do you think it's that easy to arrest someone who wiped out a half a city by himself? How do you arrest a guy like that? So the Medrash says, Shimon turned to Menashe. Menashe was Yosef's right-hand man. He was the CEO of Corporation Viceroy of Egypt. He helped him run the country, Menashe. He was the chief of staff. Yosef turns to the chief of staff, Menashe. And he says, Menashe, go arrest Shimon. Go arrest Shimon. Do you know what you're asking me to do? Do you know what it means to say, go arrest Shimon? It's like saying, uh, you know, I don't know. La I don't even want to say any names. How am I going to arrest Shimon? Says the Midrash. Menashe walks up to Shimon and puts his hand on his shoulder and grabs him to arrest him. The moment he grabbed the shoulder of Shimon, Shimon's entire body goes weak. Shimon's paralyzed and he can't move. Shimon turns to his brothers and he tells his brothers, this is not an Egyptian. Ze mi bet avi abba. This one is from our house, our lineage. He comes from our strength. This is Koach HaKedusha. This is not Koach HaTum'ah. This guy is not an Egyptian. I don't know who this guy is, but he's from our family. Oh my gosh. What is going on here? It's unbelievable. The guy that you're trying to figure out who he is, his son comes, puts his hand on your shoulder, and you say, he's from our family. He's not Egyptian. You're looking at the viceroy in the face, he's a spitting image of your father. And it doesn't dawn on you that maybe this could be Yosef himself. No. Why not? You just said. You just said that his son is, from our, is a power from our family. He himself is a spitting image of your father. And it can't be that you would recognize that this is Yosef. How does this make sense? How does this make sense, Rabotai? And the answer that many of the Baalei Musar say, 
And with this answer, I'm going to really try to up this. If they were to admit to themselves that this is Yosef, their brother, sitting on the throne, then in essence, they're admitting that they were wrong. And a person is not ready to admit to themselves that they're wrong. So they they're ready to convince themselves of a lie <clears throat> and they're ready to hold to it to the umpteenth degree even when the truth is staring them in the face but I can't accept that possibility I cannot accept that reality because to accept that this might be Yosef sitting on the throne is to accept that we were dead wrong and I can't be wrong. And it's so difficult for people to admit to themselves that they were wrong. They'd rather live a lie for 22 years, believing that, no, I was right, than to actually come around to say, you know what? Maybe that is Yosef on the throne. Maybe we were wrong. And this is a very powerful message. This tells you something about people. It's an amazing thing. How sometimes, literally, the truth is looking you straight in the face and you'll never see it. Because you're so bent on your own de'a that there's no way that you'll even entertain any other possibility. And because of that, the brothers were looking their brother in the face. They were looking at the spitting image of Yaakov Avinu. They were looking at, the, at, at his son, who clearly was from their family. And they still couldn't piece it together. They still couldn't bring themselves to say, we were wrong. These are the dreams of Yosef. It came true. He was right and we were wrong. That's actually him on the throne. It's so difficult for a person to actually admit to themselves that they were wrong. I want to tell you something, gentlemen, without going into too much detail. I recently went down to a school because there was a boy that was on the brink of being thrown out. I don't want to say what school, where school, even what level school. Let's leave it very generic in general. But the point I want to bring out to you. I came into the principal's office and I knew I was signing up for Major Bouchot because I knew that this principal, who's 10 years younger than me, I knew I knew from the get-go that he's not going to allow this kid to stay once he made up his mind that the kid got to go. And I knew that no matter what I'm going to tell him, it's going to fall on deaf ears. No matter if I'm telling him Torah, Moshe, Misinai, it's falling on deaf ears. I knew it. And many times people will tell you, why fight a battle if you know it's a losing battle? But what you don't realize is, the Torah says, Al ta'amod, al dam re'echa. Lo ta'amod, al dam re'echa. You can't sit by, you can't sit idle when blood is being spilt. And I saw this kid to be a good kid. And I know many things about this kid that made him a special, unique, and very good kid. Yes, every boy has his challenges. Every boy goes through his stuff, especially at different intervals of the challenges of life. Every boy, especially an American boy, especially so many of our boys, good boys in our community, they have their moments and they do stupid things. They do. That's what makes them young, foolish boys. And a lot of them, their brains, their minds aren't even fully developed yet. You can see sometimes that there's such an immaturity that they just don't hop 
sometimes the magnitude of the mistakes or the problems that they did until somebody comes along with a very soft touch, with a warm heart, with a certain love and a gleam in their eye and explains it and breaks it down to them. I knew I was going into a losing battle. But my job isn't to win. Because the Torah doesn't say, go in and win. The Torah says, don't stand aside idle and watch the blood spill. And that's what I did. So I went in and I fought. And I fought. And believe me, I tell you, I fought. And I told the principal, I am doing this for over 20 years. And in a very nice way, I explained to the principal that I have a better track record to turn this type of a boy around as we've been doing for 20 years. And I told him many examples of many wonderful boys that were thrown to the streets with no place to go. And min Hashamayim, Hashem helped. Hashem helped with great siyata dishmaya. And these boys were turned around and they were sent off afterwards to Israel. And many of them went into good jobs. And many of them went into night seder and chavrutot. And many of them are blossoming today as incredible, incredible success stories. The guy that once upon a time was thrown to the street, today is the guy that no one believed he'd become. I said, this is my koach, this is my specialty. I'm taking achrayut on this boy. I personally am telling you, I don't teach in high school anymore. The job was overwhelming. I had to break down at the time. I had to do what I needed to do here in the shul. We give over 30 classes a week. It came to a point where I instead decided to go and open the Bet Midrash, move on a little bit. But at the end of the day, this is what I do. I'm taking this boy, not 22 boys, one boy. Give me a month, one month. I'll turn him around. I'm asking for one month, a one month IRS extension, one month. Just give me a month. You'll see a different kid. He said to me, Rabbi, I love Ben Shushans, he tells me. I love the way you fight for these boys passionately. But the answer is no. I said, why not? Tell me something. We decided that he no longer can stay in this issue. Then I realized, once I left, he didn't want to give me a month extension. He didn't want me to take this kid under my wing, knowing my track record of tens of boys. Why is that? Then I realized what the shot was. Because if after they decided this kid has to go, and now they're going to let somebody come in and try to work to turn this kid around, they have to turn around and say to themselves, then what were we doing wrong? And that is not something that anyone is willing to admit to themselves. I am not wrong. I'll send this kid out and throw him out to the street in the middle of the year. And currently now this boy is in no yeshiva. But I am not wrong. And this is human nature. It's unbelievable. And I'm not saying anything chas shalom against this person or that person or this principal. Uh, nothing to that extent. Principal happens to be a great guy. The yeshiva is amazing. The places are great. Everyone's great. But you see so many times how this concept comes back again and again. You're looking at the truth in the face. And you refuse to accept it. Because if I accept that truth, it means that I was wrong. And I was living a lie. And nobody is ready to admit to themselves that they're living a lie. That they're wrong. But Rabotai, this explains why they didn't recognize Yosef. But why didn't they recognize Yaakov Avinu in Yosef? That we still need to answer better. We mentioned that Yosef looked exactly like Yaakov. 
Okay, so Yosef, you can't, you can't recognize him even if you tried. Because you're not ready to entertain that possibility, because that would mean you're wrong. Okay, Rabbi, I got the message. But why didn't they see their father sitting on the throne? I mean, that's a reality. He's a spitting image of your father with the beard, with the whole nine yards. <clears throat> My brother, Rabbi Avi, and I give him the credit, such a brilliant answer he told me on this question. And I want to share it with you tonight. I think this is something unreal. My brother, Rabbi Avi, told me an answer. He said, you want to know why? He says, because in the last 22 years, after they sold Yosef, Yaakov Avinu, their father, was sitting in Avelut. Like the Pasuk says, Yaakov Avinu refused to be consoled. And Yaakov Avinu was sitting in Tsar for 22 years. No son, no Yosef, no Shekhinah. We know the Shekhinah left him for those 22 years. And he sat and cried for 22 years. For 22 years, Yaakov Avinu became a ghost of a skeleton of his original form. And because of that, his brothers lived with the father that for 22 years withered away and no longer looked like himself after those 22 years. And now, 22 years later, the brothers themselves forgot what the original Yaakov Avinu looked like before the selling of Yosef 22 years ago. And now when they walk into Egypt and they're looking now at Yosef, who's a spitting image of Yaakov, but he's a spitting image of Yaakov when he was alive and vibrant, not the withered away, fake, ghostly looking Yaakov of 22 years of suffering. And because of that, you know why they didn't recognize the look of their father? Because they themselves forgot what their father actually looked like. Because the man they lived with for 22 years was a very scary skeleton of a look of what the real Yaakov Avinu looked like. And once they forgot what their father looked like alive, that's why today even when they looked at Yosef's spitting image of his father, they didn't recognize him. Not for Yosef, and not for Yaakov, because they forgot what Yaakov really looked like 22 years ago before they sold his son. What an answer, what a brilliant answer. And if this is the case, Rabbi Avi tells me now the cherry on top of this answer I think is genius. Now here is this week's parasha, a pshat rabotai that I'm hoping you'll never forget. Ani Yosef. Haod Avi Chai, listen to a new pshat. Ani Yosef, don't you recognize me? Says Yosef. Haod Avi Chai, I look like my father when he was still alive. Wow, what a pshat! Velo yachlu anototo, they had nothing to answer him. You know why? Kinev halu. Mipanav. Not that they got embarrassed, Mipanav, simple shot meant in front of him, Mipanav, but rather Kinev Halu, Mipanav. They got so embarrassed by his Panim, his appearance, his face, they recognized, they said, oh, he looks exactly like our father 22 years ago. We forgot what our father originally looked like. Before we sold Yosef. You see, when you sell a boy to the streets, you don't just kill him. You kill his father, you kill his mother, you kill the whole family. When you send that boy out, do you know what you do to the house? Do you know the disarray that you destroy a home? Do you know the parents don't sleep at night for weeks, sometimes months, because of what just happened to their son? No, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that the parents are completely innocent. And I'm not saying that the parents are uh, somewhat, you know, even... They might be, you know, guilty as well for mistakes that were done with the boy. Don't get me wrong. 
But that decision is not a one kid decision. When you throw that kid out into the street, when you sell that kid down to Egypt, you sold the whole family with him. We're talking here about Yaakov Avinu, the Gadol Hador. When Yosef was sold, Yaakov Avinu was never the same man. Yaakov Avinu was unrecognizable. He didn't even look any more like himself for the next 22 years. To the extent that his sons forgot what their father originally looked like. That now when they walk in and they look at Yosef, who's a spitting image of what their father originally looked like, they don't even recognize him. Until finally Yosef himself has a kasha. Ani Yosef, you don't recognize me? Ha'od avichai, I look exactly like my father while he was once alive. Before you sold me and you killed him. You killed him. Velo yachlu la'anot oton, they could not answer. Ki nivhalu mipanav. Because they were so embarrassed of his appearance, his face. They looked at him and they saw their father's face of 22 years ago. And they remembered what their father once looked like. And what the grief that they caused their father when they sold Yosef. And they also realized, look, do you remember what we used to say about this kid? Don't you remember 17 years ago when we paskined on him that he's a Rodev? We called him a killer. We said that nothing good's going to ever come out of this kid. That this kid's a Mejnum case. He's a lost case. He has nothing going for him. Nothing good's going to come out of this kid. Throw him out of Yeshiva. That's what we said. What? He's going to be the fourth of the Avot? Are you joking me, said the brothers? Never! He's going to fill the shoes of Yaakov Avinu, our father, to be the fourth of the Avot Akdoshim? Never! And now, look at him. He looks exactly like our father. They got so embarrassed just from his face, from his appearance. From the way he looked, you look exactly like Abba. You Be'emet could have been the Mimalem Makom of Abba. And we sold you. We sold you. We sold you to the streets. We sold you to the public schools. We sold you to Egypt. We sold you. And we killed your father in the interim. What is there to say? Unbelievable. What a pshat. What a pshat. What a pshat. What a pshat. What a reality. What a reality. Someone very close to me told me, happens to be a student of mine, a younger student of mine. Today he's a, uh, not a principal, but you would say like he's one of the... Um, assistant principals in one of the schools today and he's very good with kids and he learned the techniques over the years of how to reach the heart of a kid he learned the techniques of what it means to reach before you teach and to understand that the generation that we're dealing with today is very different different than the generations of previous years and how you have to earn a certain respect by the students and then capitalize on the good that you see in them. Trying to find something on the inside that you can build up and then build on. That's the secret of how to build people today. Once upon a time, when a Rebbe walked into a classroom, everyone stood up. <laughs> you remember those days? Everyone stood up. There was this already pre-programmed respect and submissive feeling between Rebbe and student. A lot of those dynamics today have changed. Today there are no automatics. A Rebbe walks into a classroom, 
It's not about right or wrong. It's just the way it is. This is the dar. This generation suffers from the difficulty of respect in Hakarat Tov. It's hard for them to come around to this understanding unless it's really clarified to them in a very clear way. But they don't come to it on their own. And the older generation is demanding it. And the older generation is putting their foot down and waiting for it. And it isn't coming forward. And so many parents are saying, what did I do wrong with my kids? And so many Rebbe's are saying, oh, look at this generation today. Such chutzpah kids, such this, such that. They're good kids. They're just different. They weren't wired with certain understandings of hakarat tov and respect, like maybe older generations at younger ages. They need to be literally held through the process. But once they get it, they get it. They get it. They're just slightly immature in those areas. So this student of mine, who's this, one of the uh, assistant principals of one of the schools, he told me that uh, word got out that he's very good with kids. Word got out that he basically is the guy that when a kid is not perfect and not doing what he's supposed to be doing, he's the guy that steps in and he's what we call the lifeguard. He pulls him out of the waters of trouble and turns the kid around and puts him back on a dry path, on a good path. He got a phone call one time from a principal of another school. And the principal said, I have a kid in my school. I'm about to throw him out, but I know the parents well, so I have an issue if I throw their kid out. I lost the friendship with the family that I know for many years. You hear the reason why he doesn't want to throw the kid out? Because of social reasons. All right, I didn't say that. We're on camera. Because of social reasons. He, he's a friend of the family. To throw the kid out, you have to meet the father in shul that Shabbat. It's not that simple, right? So he says... This kid I'm trying to help, but I don't know what to do with this kid. I don't know how to get the first base with this. The principal talking. So he called this guy, this assistant principal in another school, and he says, I hear you're really good with, with kids. Can you give this kid a few minutes? Maybe you can give us a, a few steps on a game plan of how to work with this type of a kid. The assistant principal says to me, Rabbi Dove, when this guy called me, my heart dropped. Because this guy threw me out of school 25 years ago. And he didn't remember me because he called me by my last name, Rabbi so-and-so. And now he's calling me and asking me how to reach a kid before he throws him out. He says, you know what I told the principal? I'm going to come down to your school and have a meeting with you. I want him to see me in the face. Over the phone, he's not going to get me. So the principal said, Bechavod Rav, we would love for you to come down to the school. You'll speak to the boy a little bit. You'll give us a few pointers of what you saw work over the years. Maybe it'll help with this kid. The next day, this assistant principal goes down to this other yeshiva. He says, I walked into the office and the principal jumps up because he heard that this guy came. He comes running out of the office and he stops. And he looks at me, he says. This guy tells me, the principal looked at me and his jaw dropped. And he said, you? You? You're the rabbi that I called yesterday to come down to help me with this kid? I threw you out 25 years ago. And this guy smiles and says, that's right. And that's why Hashem made sure that 25 years ago, 25 years later, when it's time for you to make a big decision on another kid's life, you won't do to him what you did to me. 
And the principal's jaw dropped. He says, look how Hashem, what he did here. Velo yachlu la'anot oto ki nivhalu mi panav. He tells me that after he gave the principal all the tips and keys of what to do and what not to do and how not to destroy a kid and how not to destroy a family and what to do before all that what needs to be done to turn the heart of a kid around. He says, the principal looked at me and said to me, tell me, what happened to you after I threw you out? How did this happen? He says, that when you first walked into my office, I didn't recognize you. But then when I took a second look, I, I, I recognized. But he says, you have a different face. I could see you're a different guy. I didn't even recognize you at first. How did you become this guy when you were a devil, when you were a kid? And he looked the principal in the eye and he said, right after you threw me out, God had mercy on me, and He sent me somebody to undo all the mistakes that you made with me. And that's why I'm here today, to make sure that those mistakes don't continue on this kid. It's unbelievable. Do you know how many times, guys, do you know how many guys over the years have stories that I heard about and those that I didn't hear about that bumped into old rebbies, old principals, old teachers. I mean, you have to hear <laughs> Rabbi Pesach Kron says his story about the, uh, the teacher that told him he'll never amount to anything in Klal Yisrael. Specifically when it came to writing, he told him <laughs> he has no future in writing. Rabbi Pesach Kron says the first book that he wrote he came back to the school <laughs> 30 years later and he came to show that particular teacher this is my book wow it was written beautifully and he reminded him that's right and 30 years 40 years whatever the number was you told me that I would never amount to anything and I definitely would never be able to be a writer now look of Halumi Panav do you know how many stories of guys over the years were literally told such horrible things that they're worthless and that they belong in other places and the fact that we accepted you to this school was only out of Rahmanut and it was the biggest mistake we did and we should never have accepted you in the first place they tell these things to kids you know that straight to the kids face and they have no issue they have no issue and they tell them you don't belong here you belong in a what's it called type of school I don't want to say it, I'm on camera. But these things happen every single day. You don't belong here, you belong in a messed up school. I just don't want to, that, that's not what they say. They say something else, but I don't want to say it. But you believe this. And they do this to kids every day. And the kid was made to feel like a born delinquent fool for life. And he carries that weight on him. And he carries that pain. And he carries that, that mistrust of someone who he looked up to. And, and again, I'm not making these kids into angels. They're not. They're not. I know they have all the schmutz in the world on the phones. And they did all the pranks in school. I, I'm not making them into angels. I'm not. But part of the avodah is to understand the product you're working with. And if you don't get the kids of today, and if you don't understand that a certain flexibility with a very warm, unconditional love can reach a certain point where you could find something special in this kid and use that to build up and then to build on. Do you know how easy and how quick one can turn a kid around? Could you tell me how Yosef HaSadiq remained sane? How didn't he go out of his mind?
He grew up. His brothers were all against him. They ganged up on him. They called him Rodef. They called him the Balachalomot. If you would read the Medrash of Mechirat Yosef, it would bring you to tears. The Medrash writes, oh, very what it writes there. Oh, I don't even know if I should say it over. I don't want it to. Chas uh, be mekatreg chas But Yosef was literally wrapped around. I don't want to say which brother. One of his brother's leg. And he was pleading and he was begging for his life. But I'm your brother. But I'm your brother. I'm your blood. I'm your brother. Don't do this. Don't sell me to the Ishmaelim. Don't sell me. Don't do this to me. Please. It's going to kill me. He begged him. And the brother kicked him off. And then he grabbed the next brother's leg. And the next brother. And they were literally pushing him up until they threw him to the Ishmael. What a horrific scene. Who wouldn't cry from a scene like that? Would anyone come out of that normal? Talking about the scars, talking about the trauma? They would send Yosef at Sadiq to therapy. What do, you, what, do you, what do you think the therapist would say? What, what, what do you think? And they send him down with a band Yishmaelim. They send him to Egypt and they put him on a slavery block. They sell him as a slave with the Hamorim. You know how degrading that is? You sold as a piece of an animal. And then he's brought into a house. Eshet Potiphar. What does the Pasuk say? Yom. Yom. Every single day. Every day she came and she drove him nuts. We already spoke about this. Yosef. He used to walk around the house with his eyes on the floor. So she took this wooden uh, bar and she put it under his neck and then she put two clamps on his head. So like this, he has no choice. He was barred and clamped so that he couldn't put his head down. So he would be forced to look at her. You know what she, how he was tortured? And she tortured him every day trying to get her way with him. This is an Isayom beyond words. And after all that, he's Omed in the biggest Nisayon in history. And then he gets falsely accused. He said, Bore Olam, cut me some slack. Give me a break. I didn't go through enough. No, it's not enough. They throw him down to a bar, an underground bar jail. And he's there for what? 10 years and another two years, 12 years. He's in an underground jail for 10 years, 12 years. Wouldn't you throw in the towel by then? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you claim insanity at that point? Could anyone blame you for what this kid went through? And yet, he kept going. And yet, he was an Ishmat Sliach. And yet, wherever he went, he became the leader of the jail. He TO'd the place, no matter where you put him. In five minutes, he has the place running. What got him going? What, no depression? Never DP'd? Huh? How about you guys? We all have our days. You wake up one day, I don't want to get out of bed. Yosef somehow rather didn't have those days. He's always running the place. What's the secret? I want to tell you what the secret is. And with this, you're going to walk out tonight and then I'm done. But this is the secret of life. You get this, you have everything. You have everything when it comes to relationships. Relationship with your wife, relationship with your kids, relationship with your rabbis, relationship with your mentors, relationship with your bosses, relationship with Hashem, relationship with yourself. This is the big one. Do you know what kept them going? Because at that moment, when he was in the lowest of the low and the toughest of the tough moment. And he was about to go through the biggest test that any human being is going to go through in history. And she comes at him as he comes back from the Sadeh. And she's trying day after day after day after day. Till finally the day comes and she corners him and now she's about to get him. And Yosef himself feels weak and he's about to give up. And you know what he sees. 
he sees the Yukno Shel Aviv. He sees the face of his father. And the moment he sees the face of his father, and whether that was a miracle that he actually saw this hologram of his father's face, or maybe Chazal say that he looked into the window and he saw his reflection, which was the spitting image of his father, like we've been speaking about all this class. And it reminded him of his father. It reminded him of the one person in the world that never gave up on him. Never gave up on him. And he said to himself, there's still somebody left in my corner that still believes I can be a king. My brothers called me a Rodef. Eshet Potiphar is going to try to call me some sort of a uh, immoral person. Yishmaelim called me an Eved, an Abed, a slave. Soon they're going to throw me down to a jail. They had everything to call me, but there's one person that never gave up on me. The Yukno Shel Aviv. Says the Pasuk at that minute that he saw his father's face, you know what the Pasuk says? Vayimma'en. Vayimma'en. Vayimma'en means that he held back. And he said to the woman, how can I do this to my master? I am an honest worker to him. How am I going to defy his disloyalty to go and sin like this? Pasuk says, Vayimma'en. He found the super strength to hold back. How did he get that strength to hold back? Where did the Vayimma'en come from? You want to know where it came from? Because 27 psukim earlier in Perek Lamed Zayim, Pasuk Lamed He, you know what the Pasuk says? Vayakumu banav ubnotav lenachamo. The sons and the daughters got up to console their father Yaakov after Yosef was sold. Vayimma'en lehitnachem. And Yaakov refused to be consoled. He said, don't console me. My son is not dead. Because there was a father that was Vayimma'en, therefore there's a son that's Vayimma'en. Because the father, when told, your son is dead, leave him already. Finish with him. Send him out. Chalas. Throw him out of the house. You know what the father answered? The father said, I believe in the boy. I will not be consoled. I will not mourn for him. My son's not dead. And because there's a father that believed that the son is not dead, that son was put in the toughest of positions, and he was able to do what? Vayimma'en. To hold back from the biggest sin in the world, becoming the Yosef HaTzadik of all history. Because there was a father Vayimma'en, therefore the son is Vayimma'en. But if the father threw in the towel on the son, the son is done. There is no school. There is no teacher. There is no one out there that can scream the future of your child. At the end of the day, it's you, Abba. It's you, Rebbe. It's a Rebbe that still believes in his student. It's a father that still believes in his son. Those are the people that give the strength to the kid to be Vayimma'en when it comes to the challenges and all the difficult moments of life that he needs to show strength and discipline. Just get somebody to believe in you. And then nobody can take you down. Better yet, be somebody that believes in someone and you've just given him life. Nobody can take him down. But you have to really believe in him. It has to be genuine. Kids are very fickle. Relationships are very, very sensitive. They can feel if you're real. They can feel it. They can feel if you're sketch. 
They can feel if you're putting it on. They can feel if you have ulterior motives. And they can feel if you love them. And if you love them, they feel it. And if you don't love them, even though your words are carrying a sweet tune, they will see right through it. You could be makar of them as far as you love them. But you got to believe in them. Or else they'll never believe in themselves. They have enough people out there telling them that they're going to be worthless and nothing in life. If you're not going to hold them up, nobody else will. Wow. Abba, believe in us tonight. Tonight you're deciding if Mashiach's going to come. Lel asara betevet. Believe in us. Vayiv ma'en aviv lehitnachem. Abba, be vayimayen. Refuse to continue to mourn Klal Yisrael. Take us home. Take us back. Because if you're vayimayen litnachem on Klal Yisrael, will be vayimayen on all the ta'avot and all the averot and all the gunk that we're sitting here in. Because you'll give us the strength, because you still believe that we have a shot. It'll give us the strength to believe in ourselves that there really can be a gaula this year. Yeah. I just want to end with a very short, very brief story. I've said this quite a few times, but I guess this is the cherry. We were running a uh, public school program here in the shul for many years. And then we moved it over to the Yellow House where Rabbi Avi Salem, Shem bless him, he's a great guy. And uh, Rabbi Avi told me that, um, you know, who would have imagined that all these public school kids that we work with today have become what they became? They came from, this was Yesh Me'ayin, they came from Mama Zero, from not knowing Aleph Bet, with zero Jewish pride, in public school amongst the Goyim. I want to tell you just one quick story about this. The first week we started this program was right here in this building. And we named the program the Yo Bro Program. Because, you know, as the guys came into the room, Yo Bro, 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 Yo Bro, 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 Yo, Yo Bro, Yo Bro. They went around the room, you know. So I'm in the middle, you know, I'm in the middle of teaching, I'm in the middle of giving the story, and I'm in the middle of speaking. Every time another kid would come in, I'd have to stop. Because he has to make his own, bro, 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 yo, bro, bro, bro. So after the first week, we decided we're calling it the Yo Bro Program. Bro. We started with 11 kids that first week. And um, as the kids were coming into the building... It was right after the time that we finished Minchan Arbit in the shul, during the week. There was one older man who does not pray in the shul. He just happened to come that day to catch a Minchan Arbit here. But he wasn't part of the shul. He's walking outside and he sees one of these Jewish public school kids walking into the building. The kid doesn't know where to go. It's the first week. And the kid has two diamond studs in his ears, two earrings. This old man... He played, he ripped this kid to shreds. Mamash. He started yelling and screaming. Is this the way a Jewish kid looks? Walks around earrings like a shagitz, like a goy, ripping this kid to pieces, to pieces. Now I'm hearing the yelling and I'm inside just coming out because my Amidah is always a little bit older. I come running out to see what, what, what's going on and I see this old man is killing this public school kid and the kid's like he, he doesn't know the kid doesn't know what hit him he was told to come here for a class this is, he comes to the synagogue for the first jewish class he's ever heard in his life and this is his shalom aleichem the guy my, i was like oh no no oh no 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 i ran up to this kid i literally hugged the kid i grabbed the kid and i started kind of 
running him down the stairs. And, I, and as I'm running him down the stairs, I'm turning back to him. Thank you. We'll see you next week. Take care. Inshallah. We'll see you. And I see the kid is devastated. Devastated. Mom is devastated. So I bring him into the class. And I sit him down. All the other kids. And I start telling my story. It was the opening week. I start talking to him about Shabbat and keeping Shabbat and a story about Shabbat. And as I'm telling the story, I see that this poor kid, his face is down. So I start calling out to this kid, hey, what do you think about the story? Hey, what do you think about, hey, you know, just getting him involved in the class. And I said, what's your name? He says, Rabbi, my name is Angel. I said, you look like an angel. You have such an angelic face. Look at you. Tangel, what do you think about the story? He says, Rabbi, I love this story. I said, okay, uh, guys, we're giving out the food now. Angel, you're going to come. You're going to give out the food, everybody. And then after the class, I came up to Angel and I said to him, Angel, I want to talk to you for a minute. I said, uh, Angel, and this sounds a little bit weird, but um, I love your studs. You know, uh, I'm married now for almost 25 years. I'm going to have to get my wife a 25-year anniversary present. Where would you get the, uh, the studs? Maybe you can hook me up with a good deal. You know, you know somebody on the inside says, Rabbi, I got you. I got a boy. He's one of my boys. He gets me stuff. See one. I can get you studs. I said, wow. I said, so let's talk next week. Because I'm in the market. And, and those are gorgeous. Hello. He says, you like? I said, I love them. They're ridiculous. The kid walked out of the class 10 feet tall. The next week he comes back. I said, oh, Hashem, the kid came back. Or oh, Hashem, the kid came back. He comes into the class. We tell the story. Angel, what do you think of the story? Rabbi, great story. After the class, he comes up to me. He says, uh, Rabbi, I brought you some cupcakes. And I'm thinking to myself, uh, what's in the cupcakes? <laughs> I don't know if I can afford those cupcakes. <laughs> he said, no, no, Rabbi, they're kosher. I said, I know the cupcake is kosher. I just don't know what's inside the cupcake. He says, Rabbi, they're good. My mom made them. I said, oh, wow, that's the case. Thank you. I took the cupcakes. I said, man, I didn't have lunch today. This is great. Thank you. And I put the cupcakes down on the side. So I said, Angel, I was going to say, class was great today. And then suddenly I realize, as his two ears pop out from the side of his hoodie, he's not wearing them. I didn't say anything. As the class wound down and everyone was leaving, he walks up to me and says, Rabbi, listen, I got a present for you. He pulls out this little black box. I said, Angel, no. -uh. He said, come on, Rabbi, let me give it. I said, no, 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 no. I said, those are your earrings. He says, yeah, those are my earrings. He says, but I decided I want to look a little bit more Jewish. I want to be more into the stuff that you're teaching. I realize the Jewish kids don't wear studs. So I'd rather you give it to your wife for the 25th. I was like, wow. I said, thank you. I can't take it. But I love you for offering. I really do. And I told him I'm going to enjoy the cupcakes. God knows what you put inside of him, but I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to enjoy the cupcakes. And I want to thank you because that was incredible. I said, but listen to me. You'll see that one day the world is going to find out that you're Rabbi Dovi's angel. You're special. You're an incredible kid. For the next year and a half, gentlemen, this boy did not miss a class. He came every single week. He didn't miss. He was from what you would call the founders of the public school program. He was, he was literally from those Amudim that started the class. The class took off. The class went up to 40, 50 kids. We couldn't even house it here. We had to 
get a, 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 its own location and now Baruch Hashem it's running. But this kid was clockwork and he grew unreal. And then he disappeared. I don't know where it was. I haven't seen him. A few years. A few years ago, I'm driving down Avenue U. And I'm stopped by the red light here, by the, uh, right here by the corner, by the fire uh, house. And I'm standing there by the red light, and I see a bunch of guys to my right, and they're hanging out with a bunch of girls, and they're all over each other, laughing and screaming and turning the place upside down. And I said to myself, well, looks like Goyim, and that was it. I, 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 I didn't, you know. All of a sudden I hear, Rabbi Dovi! I said, huh? It's not Goim. I roll down the window and I'm looking. I couldn't believe it. The three boys run up to the car. The girls stay behind, you know, stay. But the three boys run up to the car. And they say, Rabbi, how are you? We haven't seen you in a long time. And then I take a closer look. I say, Angel, how are you doing? Where are you? He says, yeah, Rabbi, I went out, I was, I was in a place, and then I was in a rehab, and then I was here, and I was there, and then I went to a prep school, then my parents sent me out of town, but now I'm doing really great. I said, but, I, I, you know, you, you just disappeared, and, and we were, like, so close, and you were growing, unbelievable, and, like, you know, Shabbat, and Tefillin, and all the things we spoke about, like, how you doing? He says, yeah, I'm doing great. And just then, one of his friends turned to him and said, Show the rabbi. He says, Nah. He says, Show him. Show the rabbi. I said, What? Show me what? He said, Nah, come on. Nothing, nothing, rabbi. He said, Show him. They drove him crazy. He said, Okay, fine. He opens up his shirt. And he reaches inside. I know what you're thinking. You think he pulls out a pair of CC, right? No, it's not one of those Rabbi Dovi stories. So. He reaches inside. And he pulls out a necklace. He's wearing a necklace. And at the end of the necklace, there's dangling a little cherub, a little angel. An angel. At the end of the necklace. And he looks at me and he says, You know, Rabbi, ever since I met you, even after I left, every morning when I wake up, I bought this necklace to look down and look at this angel. And every time I see this angel, I think of you. And I haven't missed putting on tefillin for the last year and a half. Because every time I look at this angel, I think of the rabbi that called me his angel. He said, everybody else thought I was a devil. But I'm Rabbi Dovi's angel. And I never stop putting on tefillin because of this. He says, I'll never forget you for that. If you believe in somebody and you reach into their heart and find something good and everyone has something that you could reach into and grab onto, build it and then build on it. Build it up and then build on it. And they'll never forget you for the rest of their lives. And then they'll remember you to the extent that one day you'll bump into who? You'll bump into them, and you won't even recognize their face. halumi panav. They'll look different, they'll act different, and you'll say, oh, this is the guy that I saw 20 years ago. It's amazing what happens when a person believes that you could become something big one day. Thank you for listening, guys. Very nice, Robert.